Wink Martindale's fascination with radio began during childhood and his ambition was to become a radio announcer. His former Sunday school teacher managed a 250 watt radio station back in the day and he gave Wink his first on-air job at $25 a week. And his radio dream was fully realized in 1971 when he began a 12-year run as the midday personality on Gene Autry's flagship, Station of the Stars, KMPC. But along the way, there was his teen-oriented dance party from Pacific Ocean Park, a gold record, the narrative deck of cards, and an appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, and 21 game shows that Wink either hosted are produced, including Trivial Pursuit, You Can Top This, High Rollers, Gambit, and the long-running Tic Tac Doe. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the man, the icon, the legend without equal in the history of radio and television, the one and the only Wink Martindale. Welcome. Thank you, Ward. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Well, you're very welcome. And, uh, First of all, where did you get the name Wink from? Well, Wink started as Winky. Uh, when I was growing up as a kid in Jackson, Tennessee, my hometown, uh, I had a playmate across the street, Jimmy McCord, and he had a little speech impediment. And Winston, my real name, uh, always came out sounding something like Winky. So I became the Winky Martindale of the neighborhood. And then when I got into radio and television, Especially in Hollywood, you don't walk down the street with a name like Winky. So I changed it to Wink, and it served me well over the years, Ward. Well, it's it definitely has been, well, it's it's history. Like I said, it's history in radio as well as television. And Wink, you have seen both industries grow since the 1950s, both radio and television. And uh, what made you want to be a radio announcer so bad? Well, when I was eight or nine years old, as long as I could remember during my youth, I wanted to be quote unquote on the radio. I thought it was fascinating that you could talk into one of these microphones and people could hear you on the other end of a radio speaker. So that was my beginning in radio, my thoughts of getting into the business. And um, I prepared myself for that first job at 25 bucks a week. Uh, thanks to my dad. My dad was a lumber inspector. We didn't have a lot. We didn't have a heck of a lot, but we didn't know that because we didn't know what we didn't have. (laughs) (laughs) My dad, although he didn't make a lot of money, every Christmas he got a crisp $100 bill as a bonus and a year's subscription to Life Magazine. So I grew up reading the pictorial Life Magazine every week. And um, I would tear out the advertisement pages And I'd go into the back bedroom of our little three bedroom house, shut the door, pretend I was on the radio, and I would ad lib commercials around the pages of Life magazine. And it helped me to to learn how to sell. And it helped my reading considerably because I've I've always taken pride in my ability to read. So that was sort of my introduction into radio. And then, uh, like you said earlier, when my Sunday school teacher, Chick Wingate, who ran the little 250 water in Jackson, uh, gave me a job. I thought my life was fulfilled. Although my dream was to get to Memphis, 85 miles away, big city, and uh, work on the number one station there, which we all listened to in Jackson because they played a lot of good music, WHBQ. So I went to Memphis and uh, I was on WHBQ for about seven years, and a lot of things happened to me uh, while I was at WHBQ, which you'll probably get into later. Oh, absolutely. And we're going to touch a bit on that incredible history that people still talk about today. What was the transition for you like from going from radio and being very successful and then transitioning to television? Was it an easy, uh, was it an easy transition? It really was. Uh, I really hadn't dreamed of being on television when I went to WHBQ in Memphis. It was my dream just to be on that radio station. And then around 1953, when WHBQ television went on the air, the general manager, uh, John Cleggern, came to me and said, we have an idea for a television show for you. And I thought, what? Television? Radio. I love that. 
but it was a little show for kids called Wink Martindale of the Mars Patrol. And it was sort of a space-oriented uh, idea. And uh, each day, 5.30 to 6, I'd have these six little kids. We called them Mars Guards. We had these six Mars Guards on. And I'd interview them. And uh, that's where my interview skills came in handy from my earlier days reading Life magazine. And we would drink our Bosco and milk. And then we'd sit back in our airplane seats and we'd get everybody to do like this, like they were going to take off. And you hear all these sound effects. And we would blast off into space. And we would segue into those uh, Flash Gordon movies. You know, those B-movies that they used to show on Saturdays between the feature movies. We'd show those for about 10 minutes. And then we'd come back and I'd do some more interviewing. We'd drink some more Bosco and milk. And then we'd say goodbye. But that that 30 minute show with six little kids every day, it's like Art Linkletter said, kids say the darndest things. And by golly, he was right. I found out firsthand. But it was great experience for me because uh, after uh, three years of success with that show, and it zoomed to number one from 530 to six every day, immediate hit. And then when that went by the by, they came to me and wanted me to be sort of the Dick Clark of Memphis. Uh, they wanted me to do a teenage dance party uh, called Top Ten Dance Party. And I had a hostess named Susie Bancroft. And it was kind of like American Bandstand. Artists in town would come in, lip sync their their records. And, uh, and, and kids from the various schools in the city would come and dance on the show. So that was my uh, second television experience. And uh, I did that for about five years before I asked for a transfer from Memphis to Los Angeles, uh, both stations owned by RKO, WHBQ and KHJ in Los Angeles. But during those years at WHBQ Radio, one of the most important events of my life occurred. Would you like to hear about it? Yes, I would. One night, it was a hot, muggy night in July, 1954. I was the morning man at WHBQ Radio, but I happened to be there that night showing some of my uh, ex-high school football playing buddies around the station. And uh, it was around 9.30, and I heard this commotion coming out of Dewey Phillips' studio. Dewey was a wild man, a wild DJ. Nobody ever liked him then or since, I think. Uh, but he, he used to play black music. That was when rhythm and blues and R&B uh, what they call race music was very popular and getting more popular with white teenagers. So Dewey Phillips was known for playing black music for white kids. And I went into his studio and I said, Dewey, what's going on? Well, it turned out that Sam Phillips, founder of Sun Records, had walked in with an acetate, uh, hadn't made a record yet, just an acetate that he had made of a singer uh, two hours earlier. And he wanted to test this to see if he really had anything. And if Dewey played it, uh, you'd know instantaneously if you had anything or not, the way the switchboard would light up. Well, the switchboard lit up. He played it seven times in a row, and I was designated by Sam Phillips to call Gladys and Vernon, his mom and dad, to find out where Elvis was. This truck driver named Elvis Aaron Presley. And uh, of course, his parents were listening they heard all the commotion, the excitement being generated on Dewey Phillips' show. And uh, I said, Mrs. Presley, where is Elvis? And she said, well, he was so nervous about his record being tested that he went to see a double feature Western. He's at the Suzor's number two over on Decatur Street. Well, they got in their truck and they went to the Suzor's number two, walked up and down the dark aisles, found Elvis sitting there all by himself watching this Western movie, whispered to him about the excitement being generated by, that's all right, mama first Elvis record. They brought him down to the station. I met him that night and he remained my friend until he left us in 1977. And it was an enduring friendship and one that I'm proud of to this day. Well, what surprised you most about Elvis? What surprised me most about EP? Well, he was, he was a one of a kind. I think that 
he truly was the king of rock and roll. That's what we called him. There was nobody before or since who was able to go out on a stage and do a live performance quite like Elvis Aaron Presley. If you've ever seen him in concert, did you ever see him in concert? Live? No, I did not. My, so I actually you, tell you the truth, Wink, I, if I remember the story correctly, my father-in-law actually had tickets to the Elvis concert a month before Elvis passed away. Really? Yes. Wow. We well, have huge so, Elvis fans. There, there's another way. If you if if you ever get the opportunity, there's a way to see an Elvis Presley concert. And uh, I was in Memphis the first night they tried this out, and it was an enormous success. It was in Ellis Auditorium, where Elvis used to go as a boy to the all night gospel sings, because he loved gospel music. Well, they set up this huge screen on each side of the theater, and they took the best of the concerts, the live concerts by Elvis, and they would show him on the screen. They would do away with the sound. There would be no voice. And then down below, there would be a live orchestra playing the charts, the arrangements, just like they were played when Elvis recorded them. Now, I, I must correct myself. Elvis would sing recorded on screen to the live music down below. Mm. And that's as close as anybody will ever get to a live Elvis concert. Are they still doing that today? Yeah, they still do that. In fact, they've done it overseas. And wherever they do it, I don't know whether it's being done at this moment or not, but wherever they do it, it turns out to be a huge success. Well, from that time, being in the at the radio station and having Elvis's first hit being played over the radio, uh, are you were you absolutely amazed to see Elvis's star rise so fast and just literally being a worldwide phenomenon, even though he never toured overseas? Yeah, I tell you, when I met him that night in 1954. I thought I was looking at some Greek God because he was, uh, I can say this as a man who's not gay, he was the best looking guy I had ever seen in my life. He was just as handsome. He looked like a, a, a male Adonis. Well, he walked in that night. I met him. And as I said, he was my friend till the day he left us. But um, that was a period of time, Ward, in Memphis that was very, very special. And it all started in 1954. And in 1955, with the release of Blackboard Jungle and Rock Around the Clock, Bill Haley and the Comets, that continued uh, from That's All Right Mama by Elvis into Rock Around the Clock and then into 1956 and more Elvis Presley, uh, Don't Be Cruel, Hound Dog, and then the Everly Brothers in 57, uh, they became extremely popular. So that's when rock and roll really, really started to roll, if you will. And uh, of course by, by 1960, I mean, uh, it, was, it was the most popular music played on radio. But I feel so blessed, Ward, because I had the opportunity to work and be a part of the beginning of rock in Memphis, Tennessee. Because with Sun Records there, Sam Phillips Sun Recording Service, through his doors walked not only Elvis Presley, but Johnny Cash and Roy Orbison. Uh, gosh, there were, there were so, Jerry Lee Lewis. There were so many who had their beginning in Memphis. So Memphis was, uh, I think, personally, I think, the king of rock in those days as yeah. a city. And I believe, Wink, that the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame should should be sitting in Memphis, not Cleveland. <laughs> totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. And I've had this uh, argument with Clevelanders for quite some time and for many <laughs> times. But the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame should be in Memphis. Absolutely. And, you know, what amazes me about the story, because you were there, and to hear Sam Phillips walk in 
with the acetate. This is, ladies and gentlemen, this is a disc that is done before everything goes to vinyl that we buy in the store. And Sam Phillips must have thought to himself, I am sitting on the biggest hit in America. I need to know what the public thinks about this. I mean, from two hours after Elvis had recorded it, it's sitting in the radio station being played on the air. He must thought he was holding gold. And it wasn't until the following Thursday that they recorded the song, which would go on the flip side of That's All Right, Mama. And that was an old Bill Monroe bluegrass song called, uh, uh, let's see, That's All Right, Mama, Blue Moon of Kentucky. I'm losing my train of thought here. Uh, Blue Moon of Kentucky turned out to be as popular as That's All Right, Mama. But, um, yeah. Yeah. I forget what your question was. Well, no, I mean, it, to me, I mean, I'm, I was trying to get into the mind of Sam, Sam Phillips thinking you just recorded this kid named Elvis and you're going to the radio station two hours later to play the play this record. So I'm thinking that in Sam Phillips heart, he is sitting on the, the biggest rock and roll hit in history. And he's got to figure out, do people, will people like this? And they went yeah. crazy at Sun Records. Uh, several months prior to the recording of That's All Right, Mama. And I've heard this story directly uh, in an interview with Scotty Moore and, and Bill Black, uh, who, were, who was the band for Elvis during those early years. Uh, at Sun Records, uh, Scotty Moore and uh, Bill Black would go in there and just, uh, just play around and, you know, just have some fun with licks on their guitar and with, him on the stand-up bass, and uh, Sam would let him just, you know, have full run of the studio for them to have fun, until uh, one night, Sam happened to be in the control room, and um, Scotty and, and, and Bill were just uh, fooling around, playing this and that, mostly country songs, and they hit on one that... Uh, sounded very interesting to Sam Phillips. And he came out of the control room. He said, what you guys doing? What is that? And Scotty said, I don't know. We're just fooling around. He said, well, try to get that together a little bit better and I'll put it on tape. Well, that thing that they got a little bit better and that they put on tape happened to be a song called That's All Right, Mama. And Elvis came in and made his recording of it. And of course, the rest as they say, is history. Wow, Wink, that it is history. And I am so happy that you're spending time with us today sharing those incredible stories and memories. Um, have you seen the new Elvis movie? Yes, I have. What'd you think? I, I, let me just say this uh, before I get to the Elvis movie, because I forgot to mention this. I am the only person living of the six people who were in the control room that night at Dewey Phillips show in 1954. Everybody else is, uh, it's gone bye-bye, but uh, I feel very blessed that I'm still around to carry the story of, of Elvis. Now, as far as the movie is concerned, uh, I want to go back and see it again. I want to see it at least three times because there's so much, when you're watching it for the first time, so much detail that you kind of, you're so involved in it, you don't, you don't really see all the little things. So I want to go back and, and look for the little things. But uh, after the first showing, and we saw it the first day it, uh, it came out, I thought it was wonderful. Uh, I've heard different opinions. I've never heard anybody say, my friends say they didn't like it. Some liked it more than others. But I thought that the young man who played Elvis and Tom Hanks, who played Colonel Parker, who I think may end up getting an Oscar nomination. I thought Tom Hanks, who told the story by narrative, in narrative style all the way through, I thought he was fabulous. And to prepare himself for that role must have been difficult. And the young man who played Elvis, I thought, is going to be a huge star. I thought he was great. And I just thought that they captured the essence of Elvis Presley so beautifully. And uh, I think this, uh, this film is going to bring a lot of younger people, a lot of the younger generation 
into the Elvis world. And it's going to make those kids want to go to Graceland to see where this, this king of rock and roll once lived. So I think from that standpoint, the uh, movie uh, is very important as well. Yeah, I was, ta- I was recently talking with T.G. Shepard, who had spent 16 years with Elvis. and Good friend and, of mine. And, oh, he, he is just, just a gentleman. Literally, T.G. Shepard is the perfect gentleman. And, he yes. was, and I, we were talking about the movie, and, and T.G. told me, he said, this is Elvis' second 68 comeback. And like you said, new fans are going to be flocking to Graceland. They're going to be watching the movies. They're going to be listening to the records more and more. And I think that uh, we're going to see more and more of Elvis Presley. Yeah, I think that the young man who played Elvis, uh, he spent two years preparing for that role and for that filming. And uh, I, I think that the, the performances he did, especially the performances on stage, he had all the moves and some of the songs you may or may not know this, but uh, a lot of the songs he, he, uh, he did lip sync to Elvis's records, but some of the songs he sang himself. Did you know that? Yes, I did. Yes, I yeah. did. And I've, I've been very, for- yeah, I've been very fortunate Wink, to talk to some of his, ve- to Elvis's close friends. I mean, we're talking private conversations that they've had with Elvis and when they saw the movie, they were blown away on how incredible Austin Butler was portraying Elvis. That's they, they even told me, I mean, TG was one. He said, I'm sitting there watching it in the theater. And there were times where I'm thinking I'm looking at Elvis and not Austin Butler. It was that good. There there were times when you would catch him, you know, in, in a profile or in a certain move and you'd swear it was Elvis. No question about it. Jerry Schilling, uh, who was, uh, portrayed in the movie by I don't know who, but Jerry was one of the closest friends of Elvis. And I was interested to find out what Jerry thought of the movie. And he thought it was terrifically done and is very pleased the way it turned out. Yeah. And I will be talking to Jerry Schilling here pretty shortly about uh, his time with Elvis and of course the Elvis movie. Wink, what do you remember of the last time you saw Elvis? Well, it's easy for me to remember, although it's rather sad. On my birthday in 1977, uh, Sandy took me to, no, I'm sorry, 1976, because he passed in 77. Uh, He was playing Las Vegas at the International Hotel. He was doing two shows a night. And she took me, by the way, my wife, Sandy, uh, Elvis dated her for six years, but I won. You see, I'm still <laughs> standing. <laughs> but uh, Sandy said, how would you like to go see Elvis? I said, that'd be great. So as my birthday present, she took me over there. And uh, after the first show, um, we went backstage. Elvis asked us to come back to his dressing room. So we went back. And uh, as you might imagine, the dressing room was packed. People were, it was overflowing with people. Ginger Alden, his fiance at the time was there and so many other friends of Elvis, but he only wanted to talk to Sandy and me this particular night. And I remember he was standing behind the bar and we were outside the bar, you know, talking to him face to face. And the room was quiet as a mouse. Everybody wanted to hear what he was talking to us about. It so happens that, uh, Elvis had seen us that day on a game show on CBS called Tattle Tales with uh, Bert Convy as host. And it was a show where, you know, how much do you know about your spouse? And not only were we on the show, but uh, we won that day. And he couldn't get over how much minutia, much detail that we knew about each other. Of course, As of today, we've been married 47 years, so we've had a long time to find out (laughs) about each other. And um, we we talked, and uh, I remember he he said something to me that I've always uh, appreciated and I've never forgotten, I'll never forget. He said, Wink, look at you. Look at at how well you've done. Look at, at, at your career. 
and I'm so proud of you. And later when Sandy and I left, she said, can you imagine Elvis Presley looking you eyeball to eyeball and saying, wink, look how well you've done. <laughs> I mean, that was the man that was uh, the king of rock and roll. He's telling me how well I've done. So, um, it, the sad part of it was Ward that, uh, he was puffy. Uh, he was pale. He obviously was not, not well. He was, he was ill in several ways and for several reasons. And when we left and closed the door behind us, when we got back to our hotel, Sandy and I both broke down and cried. We just sobbed because I had said to Sandy, that's the last time we'll ever see him alive. And indeed it was. So that was, that was the last time I saw him again, sad to say, but, um, I'm glad that I did get to see him one more time before he left us. Well, did you ever tell Elvis because you married Sandy that you won? <laughs> no, that, that, uh, we had we had some jokes about that, but uh, I never, I, I I was never so bold as to put it in those words. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Elvis probably would have laughed about it. Uh, yeah, uh, laughed about that. But I want to ask you so a bit. I want to kind of leave on a, a happy, a high note here. And you are literally the most iconic game show host that's ever graced television and you've hosted and produced 21 of these shows. Which one was your favorite? By the way, I never could hold a job. That's the reason I <laughs> you know, either hosted or, or, or produced that many shows. I would have to say, uh, I, I was lucky. I, I did have some, some successes, several. The first was Gambit on CBS which was on the air, lasted five years. And then uh, a show called Wheel of Fortune knocked us off the air because their ratings got to be bigger than ours. <laughs> yeah, I remember when Wheel of Fortune came on to me one day, the producer came up to me and he said, you know, I saw the show that's on opposite us now on, uh, on NBC. And uh, he said, it's called Wheel of Fortune. I said, ah, don't worry about it. Nothing's going to affect our show. He said, uh-uh. Don't ever say that. That'll come bite you in the butt every time when you say something like that. Well, who but, are... Uh, my favorite show was Tic Tac Doe because it gave me the longest run. And you get used to those checks coming in on a regular basis. Oh, I did that for all 13 wait, years. Wow. I, because you, did, who are some of your favorite game show hosts out there? Well, my favorite game show host of all time, and I think the person who did it best, better than anybody else was a young man by the name of Bill Cullen. Bill Cullen was bright. He was jovial. He was intelligent. He, he was funny. He could, no matter what, he did a bunch of different shows over the years because, you know, producers wanted Bill Cullen. So when he would leave, leave a show, you know, you'd move right into another show, kind of like me. I, I moved from one show to the other until they found me out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it seems like today, um, with you know, like Will of Fortune, you know, Pat Sajak, I can never see anybody else in that role. And no, you know, there, there are certain hosts, I've always said this, and I believe it sincerely, that certain hosts are indigenous to certain shows. Uh, Wheel of Fortune, Pat Sajak. Uh, the late, great Alex Trebek. Uh, nobody will ever top him doing Jeopardy, uh, although it's a great show and remains on the air and will for years and years, I'm sure. Uh, Bob Barker uh, was, I think, the very best to ever do The Price is Right. And I would like to think that Tic Tac Doe, my show. <laughs> hey, I agree with that. And one last question for you, Wink. What is... Is there a, an element or a, I'm trying to figure out the right word here. Maybe it's a, a vibe. What does it take for a game show host to uh, be very um, personable with the contestants to bring the best out of them when it comes to hosting a game show? 
Well, I've always said this, and I, I believe it, that first of all, first and foremost, you have to be a people person. You have to like people, period. You know, otherwise you're not going to be a good game show host. I always look forward to that, that uh, 60 to 90 seconds when a new contestant would walk out and I had the opportunity to uh, converse with them for, for, for that short period of time to see just what I could bring out in that person that we would be of interest to the folks in the audience and those watching at home. So I think that's, uh, that's an important element in being a game show host, to be able to interview and also to play the game, to know the game so well that you don't have to use cue cards all over the room. It's up here so that whatever happens, uh, you can handle it without asking for help from the producers. <laughs> well, you are absolutely the utmost professional. And again, you are a, a legend an icon. You're well loved by uh, America. I, you know, you're you're part of this nation's history, especially for Thank radio you. and television. But what is next for Wink Martindale? Well, uh, I'm happy to say that uh, July 18th through August the 1st, I'll be doing the 14 hour Elvis Presley story. I narrated it and hosted it and produced it several years ago. Uh, and then when he passed, we did an extra hour, you know, about to cover the death of Elvis Presley. But again, July 18th through August 1st, it'll be on KWXY, Palm Springs. I do a show there every day from 1 to 3. It's at 1340 a.m. or 920 a.m. If any of your viewers would like to, to listen. Or on the computer, it's kwxy.com, free streaming kwxy.com, free streaming. And again, 14 hours starting uh, Monday, uh, July the 18th. And it runs two hours every other day for two weeks. I'm tuning in, Wink, because I'm a big Elvis fan. My whole family's a big Elvis fan. So we're going to tune into that and uh, just enjoy everything you bring forth about, well, the king of rock and roll and uh, Wink, what it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to have you on the program today, sharing with us your your long career in radio and television and your close friendship with Elvis Presley. Thank you very much, Ward. It was a pleasure being with you, and thank you for the time. It's always a pleasure. Amen to that. And ladies and gentlemen, Wink Martindale, wow, what can you say? But I will tell you this right now, I'll be right back after these messages. You haven't seen anything like Ocu 2020. Primrose Leaf brings you the ultimate optimal eye support formula, containing more than 12 natural ingredients specifically designed and formulated to improve and maintain the health of your eyes. Ocu 2020 may help with the prevention of cataracts and macular degeneration, providing antioxidants specific for your eyes, and proper ocular pressure for those with glaucoma. Don't let the windows to your world be less than their best. Get Ocu 2020 today and start to see things in a whole new way. 844-376-0007 or primroseleaf.com. 